This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's a noon hour on Thursday again, folks. Ted Rolson here in our uh, Waimanalo Beach studio of Think Tech Hawaii with our weekly show, Where the Drone Leads, where we bring our, our viewership uh, great information about the emerging technology, regulations, policies, and procedures, and people associated with this expanding world of drones. And today, uh, we're having a kind of a, a, a bookending affair here. We've got uh, Kat Swain at the AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, standing by in sunny but cold Maryland right now. <laughs> Kat, welcome to our show. Well, thank you. I wish I could stay sunny and, and warm like they're in Hawaii, but not quite. It's a little cold here in Maryland, but thanks for having me. Even if, it's, even if it's sunny where you are, it's still going to be cold, and that won't <laughs> change until about April or so. so Pretty anyway, much. You know, we're, we're, we're in the what I call the Arctic stage now. <laughs> for sure, and uh, we're enjoying the tropics, and so uh, next time you'll have to actually come out here. But anyway, uh, so we have a cat from AOPA uh, in a really unusual development in my mind within AOPA, the AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, a legacy organization dealing with basically people and pilots and, and the utility of aircraft, is now reaching down into UAVs, unmanned air systems, drones. And to have that happen is a really significant measure, I think, and mark for the rest of us because that says that somebody outside this business is really recognizing the potential value of it and the potential reach and breadth that the technology and the and the business might have and therefore AOPA needs to get involved. So Kathy, of Kat, uh, tell us how AOPA made that determination, made that decision to get involved and to start having a segment of, of your business associated with drones. Well certainly, well, again thanks for having me. Now as you know the the commercial UAV when we had section 333 kind of propagate back in 2013 and then with the launch or adoption or implementation of 107 in August of, of 2016, AOPA has always, I wouldn't say always, but we've been at the forefront of a lot of the formation talks of 107, kind of, I guess, behind the scenes. We didn't launch our drone membership until February of this year. So that's kind of when we had our, I guess, public outcoming, so to speak, into the drone space. But we had been doing a lot of work in D.C. with the FAA, a lot of, um, a lot of the ARCs and everything trying to formulate some of the drone regulations and making for safe integration. So it's not like we had really been new to the space. I guess it was we were new to the public in the space. And when I came aboard to AOPA, I've been a member ever since I was 16 years old. I'm a manned pilot and CFI, flight instructor and drone pilot and 107 remote pilot. But when I came aboard as an employee in March of 2016, the organization brought me on board and said, Kat, you know, we, we want to welcome drone pilots to the community. Our, our name is Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association. 107 gave remote pilots a pilot certification. So they're pilots, just like manned pilots. We're just unmanned. So it's a new class in certification in drones or aircraft, according to the FAA. So realistically, it was, it was really the perfect community for them to join us as we work through this growth of safe integration into the national airspace. So uh, I thought it was the perfect fit. That's a really cool thing. And I, I must say that uh, I think I first joined AOPA in 1963 when I got my commercial. And I was just reviewing some of that today. And back in those days, there, we, had, we were just excited about the new miniature vacuum tube radios we had in the airplanes. <laughs> and we had the, the, the Lears and the uh, and the narcos and the arrow ears and such, and, and I've just found out today that those are now considered antiques. And those are <laughs> miniature vacuum. Yes, I, I won't date myself to the, the days of Loran and everything else, but <laughs> but yes, we have come a long way. And, and with new technology, it's it's just like when when we saw the adoption of helicopters into general aviation back in the day, and more and more people in general aviation started that. It was just another piece in aircraft and pilot in the community. Same thing with the remote pilot. The only difference is where they control the aircraft from. Their aircraft is still flying in general aviation airspace. That's exactly right, general aviation airspace. And, and that brings in a, a, a couple of other interesting perspectives, at least from my per, from what I can see. There's probably more RPA or drone pilots uh, registered today than there are uh, fixed-wing pilots, I would, or man pilots, I would assume, or if, if not, it won't be long. 
And if all the people out there who actually are operating drones actually got their certificate, we'd see probably twice what we have today on the books. So the body count is going to go way up in terms of uh, membership and need for representation and need for education and need for standards. The uh, point of view they're all coming from is quite, diff quite different from what we have in the legacy aviation business where you come from a, a, a situation where the training is not just the book learning or passing the test, but it's also practical test that goes along with and so that the two go together. Whereas in the uh, world of RPAs, there's no practical test required. It's strictly a, a airspace uh, regulatory orientation in the test. And, and the practical experience is uh, acquired by some other means. So anyway, we have a, a, a different channel of entry and we have a different frame of mind of the people coming in that channel. So education yeah. and getting people to understand policies, procedure standards, the way aviators think and this sort of thing and the way the airspace is operated is going to be quite an interesting uh, uh, challenge. And it's, it's really cool that you guys are there because if there's probably nobody better equipped to think that through than AOPA. Well, I appreciate that. And I think that there's, you know, there's other organizations out there that support corporate 107. There's organizations out there, and we won't name them all, of course, but organizations, longstanding organizations that support um, RC hobbyists, which I'm a member of. I've flown RC since I was little. So I think all of us have a place, um, all of our organizations have a place to help this movement of safe integration, to help the growth of drone industry without stifling the innovation, of course. Because like you stated, it's it's different entry points. Uh, I kind of view it as kind of a, a three entry point system. You know, you have the 107 commercial operators. Then you have the, what I call traditional RC hobbyists that have come up through maybe the ranks of AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics. And then you have kind of the new, what I call the new generation hobbyists, the one that goes and buys it from, let's say an amazon.com or a big box store. That's the person really that I think all of us are trying to reach out to, to help educate, because those are the people that really have no aviation connection at all. So those are the drone operators, the hobbyists, or the getting ready to be the new entry points into 107 that have no aviation background or connection. So when you say, you know, are you aware what airspace you're flying in? They go, what's airspace? So those are the people I think that is not just AOPA, but all of us in the drone space, all the associations and organizations have a responsibility to help educate. That's exactly right. And so uh, determining what that educational material is and the orientation of it, the uh, entry point, uh, what the objective at the end of the day is for education. Is it uh, compartmentalized into certain categories or is there like a, a standard uh, endpoint? That's a, a lot of things that are, that are being discussed and, and we, we have a lot of interest in understanding how you're thinking about that here in Hawaii. Because we have a situation where we have um, some commercial uh, providers of 107 training, for example. We have uh, a lot of uh, backyard conversations, things that help people get ready on a, on a private basis. We have a, a, a budding system within the university and the community colleges we have to generate in order to provide training for uh, uh, professional operators in the construction industry or the uh, uh, maritime industry and such. And, and we haven't done any of that. We, we can see it, we need it, but we haven't actually got to that point yet. Uh, so having knowledge of whatever you guys are doing and thinking about your roadmap, you sharing your roadmap if you can with us would be fantastic. We can start populating and testing. We do have a workforce situation out here in Hawaii. Uh, if we have to, if one more company wanted to hire a bunch of drone operators, they probably don't exist with a uh, with a creditable uh, uh, accreditation that would allow them to go forward and operate. They can get a 107 for sure. But in terms of the real knowledge you need beyond just the airspace issues, how do you actually operate? What happens when faults occur? What about when there's uh, uh, a, a potential conflict or something like that or something goes wrong? These things are, are what you learn in the practical domain and we really need to figure out how to train them and have them ready for that when the hiring comes around. So that's going through our minds right now. But the, you, you mentioned airspace and the low altitude airspace. Of course, the uh, FAA uh, UAS integrated pilot or integration pilot program which we all just submitted our, uh, our applications for last Thursday uh, is, is been coming around in between March and May when the awards will start coming out. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on how that program is viewed in terms of uh, kind of forcing out this issue of low altitude integration and who owns the airspace. Is it the FAA on the airspace? Is it the local jurisdictions, which is the forcing function here? Mm -hmm. How do you guys 
see that, and how do you see this IPP program assisting and pulling all that together? You know, F, uh, AOPA is part of the Drone Advisory Committee, so we're, we're deeply entrenched in helping a lot of that regulation and a lot of that roadmap move forward. But that's it's not an easy process. You know, you, you brought up a lot of good points that there's, you know, we're so used to federal preemption. So we're used to the FAA controlling airspace from the blade of the ground all the way up to the, the top of the sky. And that's never been an issue in manned aviation before. But when you have the UAS community, that that is an issue because we can we can take off and land pretty much anywhere you know, given, given permission. And so it, it's, it's not as easy to say, okay, well, federal preemption is the law of the land. Um, and that's the way it's going to be state and local tribal. Sorry, you don't have any, any role in this, in this space. There has to be some type of compromise. And I think that's where you saw the birth of the pilot program come out of. We, we all realize that there has to be some kind of compromise. There has to be a role for state and local and tribal governments to play in the UAS space. We can't just simply say that the way that we've done things before is the way that we're going to do things now, because um, it doesn't always work with new technology like UAS. So with the pilot program getting ready to launch, and I was excited to hear from the FAA at um, CES this week that they are moving forward. I think that they have two, over 200 applications completed and getting ready to select, I believe they said 10 uh, people or 10 organizations uh, for the initial rollout. Um, so I'm excited to see what that's going to mean. Um, I still think that when I say I, AOPA, that federal control of the airspace is a must to some degree. However, there has to be some type of compromise for state and local to have some type of enforcement for, let's say, launch and land areas, areas of let's say overflights of a um, public gathering, something of that sort. There has to be some type of protection and control mechanism for that, I, I do believe. And I'm hoping that through the pilot program, you'll see some of that develop. We'll talk about that a little bit more after our, our one minute break here, Kat. Be right Sounds back. good. It is still the Thursday noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here in uh, Waimanalo Beach uh, with our show where the drone leads. And our guest in Maryland is Kat Swain from uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA. First, first, fl first time flyer on this show, but we'll get you back again sometime, I'm sure. Wonderful. And by the way, Russ Baker's in town and we're all heading down for a town hall meeting at six o'clock down at the airport tonight. So we, that's the bookend. We have AOPA on the show today at noon. We have the boss here in, <laughs> in flesh and blood on uh, in, the, in the evening. In fact, when you mentioned that uh, AOPA had just started about a year ago publicly talking about its involvement in, in UAS, but had worked working behind the scenes privately for some time, that's interesting to, to hear that because my first contact with AOPA having anything to do with UAS was when we had a town hall meeting out here in Hawaii that Melissa McCarthy uh, M McCaffrey came out for. and. Uh, we had it down at the Capitol, it was called the Aviation Caucus, and I was struck by the fact that in this Aviation Caucus, half the discussion was about unmanned air systems, and here AOPA was leading the discussion. So that was, uh, that was certainly uh, a, a welcome surprise and, and a good one. But back to the question we were discussing uh, before the break and at the break, coming up with a model for how a local jurisdiction or a combination of local jurisdictions and uh, local could be all the way from a state, uh, the entire state, like here in Hawaii, to a tribe or to a city or to something that's uh, less than state in scope. How 
they would have the knowledge and the capability to manage the situations that occur in air operations, albeit low, you know, 200 feet, 400 feet, your choice, uh, is still an obligation, it would put on them an obligation that they don't have today. I think they manage uh, roadways pretty well, the, you know, the two-dimensional stuff, they got that figured mm -hmm. out. Adding that third dimension and the issue, additional issues required, if you just can imagine the Department of Transportation and wherever it is you might think of where you get your driver's license, just quadruple the size of that to handle the air side of it, the usual laws of scaling uh, would, would generate something like that. So, uh, or the way we put it here is, okay, if we had one drone over Honolulu, we got that figured out. Two drones, well, that's interesting. I wonder who owns the second one. 500, 1,000? Uh, this becomes a, a, a complicating, uh, complex situation very, very quickly. So, I think, you know, you bring up a good point, and I'm hoping that some of the research and the data that we'll get from the pilot program will help kind of scope that out and tell us what direction we need to go when it comes to federal and then state, local, and tribal. You know, we, ever, I think everybody can agree in the drone space that we can't keep doing the same thing that we are doing um, with, you know, this, this kind of patchwork of state and local laws with each state. And then within the state, you have cities putting up different ordinances. For somebody that's, for let's say a 107 operator that's, you know, regional or local, that's not so difficult for them. But if you consider a lot of these companies that are trying to do nationwide drone as a service or, or whatever type of nationwide drone company, trying to disseminate and trying to abide by all the different and stay knowledgeable of all the different drone laws that are out there is a little mind numbing. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of the insurance business when I was in the insurance business a ways back, trying to keep up with everything in, in state and local. It, you know, for the for the drone space, there has to be some type of compromise. It's different. This is where it's different than manned aviation. You know, in manned aviation, state and local has a place to, I don't want to say play, but a place to be when it comes to the airport environment of where airplanes take off and land. In the drone space, it's obviously different because we're not restricted by that same airport um, authority. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to see, you know, and, and I've heard from, from the FAA that within, once this pilot program launches within a year, that we'll have some good data to start making some decisions based on that, so. Well, that's good. And then I, I, think it, I don't want to have to pull out the crystal ball, but I, I really think it's, you know, it's kind of the wait and see what kind of happens with this pilot program. Uh, certainly, um, we're all sitting when, uh, with anticipation of uh, how the awards are going to go and, and how, uh, they'll, how we'll execute. In fact, in our particular case, uh, we, the state of Hawaii was one of those applicants, and uh, we realized that the first six months of this is going to be a lot of dialogue, just like we're having right here, with our stakeholders all over the place. And stakeholders come on in our in our state in four different counties, and they all have different uh, social political situations that affect how people think and how their how their needs are stated. So we really have to get down to the community and the needs, and it has to be accepted by the community and actually voted on by them to a large extent. And so this requires a lot of, uh, a lot of patient uh, uh, outreach and uh, uh, mental testing as well as uh, physical testing and, and uh, starting at the 107 level, what's wrong with 107, what, how does that have to extend, and how do these uh, agencies all interact with each other in terms of uh, management. And then you start putting in, like some of the legislation we've seen in the past has put in like offset barriers, like 500 feet back from a waterfall or can't approach an uh, invasive species by closer than 200 feet or something. Well, who's got a 200-foot yardstick? And where was that yardstick calibrated? Is the, is the calibration laboratory certified? <laughs> I mean, it's all those questions that, as you know, how they tumble in aviation. And so when you put limits on and physical measurable parameters in, now you have to also provide some way to do the measurement. And mm -hmm. that's not a real practical thing. So I, I'm uh, equally anticipating that we're going to learn a lot from this. In fact, that's what, uh, what uh, the head of uh, UAS Integration Engineering at the FAA said at a conference we had at, uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico just a month ago. He said, we hope our success to us would be a giant locker full of data. That <laughs> is right and wrong. Stuff that works, stuff that doesn't work, it doesn't matter. A locker full of data that is produced by public-private partnerships pushing as hard as they can into this frontier. And so that was kind of an interesting, really open-minded statement as to what success would look like. 
Well, I think it's kind of true. I mean, we're 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 in a space with a new technology still. I mean, you could say it's it's not new anymore. It's been around, but I mean, as far as the 107 space being new and the regulatory world being new in 107, you know, there's there's very limited data when you look at the history of the FAA and and everything involved. I mean, even so far as to look at different different segments of UAS. I mean, for instance, let's say UAS insurance and how an insurance company would would write the risk for UAS commercial insurance. They have no actuary data to go based on, so very limited actuary data. So they're just taking a small scope. So I remember when that first came out, insurance companies were were basically um, insuring UAS like manned aircraft, which is a little crazy in my mind, but that's the only data that they had to go on. So that's how they were insuring the risk. Now, of course, they're they're accumulating data as they as UAS has been around, and they have other other stuff to look at, and they're able to ensure the risk properly. But it's kind of the same aspect when you're looking at the FAA; they have limited data to go on, so they have to do their risk assessment and safety assessment. That has to be based on historical data. So you know, there's a, there's a little bit of you know you can you can toss it up in the air and see if it flies. But realistically, when you're talking about safety of people and property on the ground. You know, you've, you've got to have a, a equivalent level of safety built in. That's an interesting uh, observation that, uh, that, again, in that case, uh, did not have a model for how to generate insurance policies and such. We come ac- have come across something here in, in Honolulu that's interesting. A lot of the, uh, most of our property, all of our uh, drones in the small drone category all run on unlicensed public network communications, 2.4, 5.8, that kind of thing. And... Uh, they work fine out in the field, out in the remote areas where there's no interference, but you get in a, a, a dense urban core when there's a lot of cell phones going off and a lot of routers talking to each other and such, 2-4 is full. And uh, so the ability to get any range out of them is extremely limited, or said the other way, RFI, uh, RF interference can uh, shut them down in a heartbeat with a very close range in a way we hadn't anticipated. So spectrum management and uh, uh, signal to noise ratio, those technical terms that people who are operating these things don't necessarily know about are going to be important for us to pull up. And I hope that the IPP program shows that as an, er- an issue. And there's got to be other ones as well. Well, for example, uh, uh, performance in a, in a crosswind. Uh, if you miss a waypoint, can you get back to it? Well, maybe not. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so there's, so uh, there's performance standards. There's going to be uh, uh, spectrum standards. There's going to have to be uh, radio climb and uh, the youth. Unfortunately, we're going to get right back into aviation. It's it's all about the technical parameters that make something work in a complex environment when you have to adjust for faults. And that is the picture that I think we're going to find exposed uh, through the IPP process. But certainly, we and the other 200 participants are going to do the best to generate that locker full of data. <laughs> and uh, so we'll 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 look for your continued. I'm feedback. I'm excited to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, we, we have almost at the, at the end of our time here, but I wanted to ask about what, how AOPA sees the future coming. What, besides the IPP, what do you see as the big issues coming in, in 18 we ought to be thinking about? You know, I think a lot of it, like I like I said in the beginning, is the education and outreach part, and that's that was one of our primary goals is to get out there and educate. We started first and foremost with free seminars that we basically – Um, gave and provided to the local flight school community nationwide and said, okay, flight schools, here's 107 um, seminar data with guides and everything. We'll help you market. We'll help you do all that part to get that message out to your local community. So we started that. That was very successful this past year. Now what we're doing, though, is kind of switching to more of an online digital format so that we can reach a bigger audience because we saw that audience was very large, but we could only reach them there in the local areas. So since that was such a popular seminar and um, popular outreach, we're making that an online presence in 2018 and also building out additional safety content and educational content for all specters of 107. That is really interesting. You know, on this show, we always like to get something out of it that people can take home with them and such. I'd like to take that one home in terms of getting access to the AOPA generated general awareness and uh, specific issues of, of discussion in whatever form they're available in webinars or online resources to work within our own university system here and then the community colleges and then the schools. So uh, tell me how I do that. I mean, I am, I'm a card-carrying AOPA, AOPA member and didn't know this. 
Definitely. Well, we are putting everything up on our website right now. So AOPA.org and under drone pilots, we'll have all the online resources available to you. Like I said, we're in the process of moving the seminar from an in-person seminar to an online, and that'll be done this quarter. And then we're also building up a whole library of video content for our membership and also for our non-members as well, because it's important to, like I said, not only educate our AOPA members, but also provide that outreach to the UAS community, to those people that might not know about aviation that really need to know about the airspace that they're flying in. So that outreach is so important to not only our membership, but also have the responsibility of helping educate the entire UAS community that, that needs it. Now, that, you know, that's a good point. I, I, I would offer that 99% of the, AO, of the uh, drone or UAS community does not know about AOPA. So we'll do our best to help them out here. But uh, I, as a member, can get access to that material on the website. Can my friends who are not members, can they get access to some of that material? They can get access to some of that as well. So okay. we've also provided pilot protection services, which is a legal services in-house legal services protection for our membership only. Um, that is a benefit as an AOPA member, so that if there's any type of questions when it regards to legality of 107 or goodness, uh, federal enforcement action against 107 or 61 pilot operating as a hobbyist, you know, our, our legal staff is here to help answer all those questions. That's great. Well, I think we're going to uh, spend some time digging into that and finding what's available because it's, it's probably expressed in such an understandable way compared to a regulation. And that's really <laughs> useful for getting people's attention. If they can understand it, they'll do more. If they can't understand it, so. it makes it kind of cumbersome. So Kat Swain uh, at AOPA, the uh, senior executive in charge of UAS integration at uh, AOPA, integration uh, UAS Futures, thanks so much for coming on our show. We really want to get you back on again. Every quarter is going to be a whole new revelation of some kind that we need to hear from, uh, from AOPA. And Thanks we'll, for having me. I look forward to coming on in the future. Well, we'll tell Mark about the show this afternoon. We see him down at the airport tonight. So Sounds good. Tell anyway, him aloha. <laughs> uh, aloha, and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. See you all next week, folks. Okay. Hey, that was, that was really cool. Uh, you we know, needed longer uh, than 30 minutes. <laughs> say again? I said we needed longer than 30 minutes. We, so we much used to have to talk about. Yeah, I know. That's why we, we used to have 45 minutes, but nobody, no networks want a 45 minute format. So we cut it to half an hour. And, you know, you get through 10% of what you wanted to talk about, but we hit the good stuff. And, uh, Very good. Uh, uh,